Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for our webinar, MetLife's QA Transformation Journey into the Digital Age. Um, before we get started, um, let's go over some housekeeping. So this webinar is getting recorded right now as we speak. We will be sending an email to you tomorrow with the recording and slides in case you have to log out early. Um, don't worry, we'll have that for you. Uh, there's a questions panel. Please, throughout the webinar, fill out any questions you might have. We'll try to get to those throughout the webinar, um, and we're saving about 10 minutes at the end of the webinar to answer those questions. Um, we also have an end of webinar survey. We'd love to get your feedback um, on this webinar, and there's a question. Um, if you have any questions left over, you can ask them there, and we'll get back to you. Um, so I'd love to introduce our panelists today. We've got Chris Vartosik, Director of IT at MetLife, Kim Donica, VP Global Tech at MetLife, and Amir Rosenberg, Director of Product Management here at Perfecto. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Hello. Hi, guys. All right. So, Chris, so... off to you. Okay, uh, so I'm Kim Donica. I'll kick it off here with the first couple of slides. Just a quick introduction uh, with my background. Um, I'm the Vice President at Global Technology um, at MetLife um, at our headquarters, our technology headquarters in the RTP area of North Carolina. Um, I lead our software quality team. Um, I've had multiple roles throughout my IT career, both at, at MetLife and in management consulting prior to that. So I've been, um, you know, I have experience in all areas of the SDLC from development, project management, um, and support and operations. Um, I've been leading the quality team uh, since late 2015, and the journey we've been on the last couple of years um, is our focus of today. Uh, so I'll get on here to the first slide, kind of the QA overview. Um, so again, I mentioned a couple years ago, we formed a new team. Uh, we brought together two organizations at MetLife. Um, we had tests or QA built into two different AD organizations. And what we did is looked at bringing them together to create one higher performing team. Now, I say the teams were doing a both solidly functioning teams, um, doing a good job across many projects with a heavy workload. Um, but the organizational design um, really facilitated a focus on test more than that broader look um, at quality. Um, kind of in, in, to put it in, like, I guess a bit of a, some terms to say, the QA has always been commoditized or testing has always been commoditized in some ways. Um, and we were more in the order taker mode, working with our AD, AD teams to deliver testing for their projects. Um, the focus was also kind of kept, kept us with a bit of a tunnel vision in terms of innovative capabilities. Um, just because of the organizational design, we were so focused on projects, there weren't resources or funding uh, to do the next thing, like automation. We were very manually focused, again, doing a good job with, with the testing that we were doing, but not positioning ourselves as well as we should have um, for kind of the new the new tool sets and capabilities that are emerging, you know, in the IT landscape. So what we embarked on a couple of years ago was this, was this journey to look at the organization from a people, process, and tools uh, perspective. So um, afterwards, what you'll see here is kind of the after picture, um, the four key pillars, our organization, and, and kind of where we're at with our portfolio. So what we did is whereas in the prior paradigm, I would say we were all test delivery teams, um, and people were doing work off the side of their desk uh, to support test management tools. If someone was doing innovation, it was an, an in individual who came up with good ideas and made it happen, and it was very hard to reuse them or productize them. Um, and so now we created an organization that facilitates uh, making those things happen. So first of all, we still, of course, have test delivery. That's a big portion of our resources and a big portion of our dollars. But we've also separated out um, our governance team to ensure that our process standards, our financials, our reporting, our strategy are common across all of our delivery model 
whether rather than focusing on what a particular development team or business partner wanted on a particular project. So um, allows us to have a stronger model, um, you know, and seat at the table with those partner teams. Um, and then our engineering team. So that's what Chris is going to talk about a lot today. Is that again in prior iterations, a, a test engineering team didn't exist. So some of the functions were being done for sure. We had a, a, an excellent test reporting tool, we had a test management system, but us being like active in terms of R&D and providing a test architecture view and solutions uh, to creatively solve the problems that we were encountering in testing you know, didn't exist in a formal way. So uh, we changed the organization to have a lot more formality around the roles and responsibilities. Um, we've always so the second section here, we talk about our organization. We're in four locations in the U.S. We've got uh, resources, a significant portion of our vendor resources in India. So we also have a test lab in Mexico. Um, and at times, we'll have resources in Brazil as well. Uh, a large group, we have 650, 650 resources um, on any given day um, between our consultant, consulting team and full-time employees. Uh, we manage a huge volume of work. We see this over 1,200 projects a year. So the organization, and this has been, what I'm stating now has always been true, always a big volume, always able to dynamically scale up and down to support the business needs. Um, and over the past year, year and a half, our, we've grown our portfolio by about 10%, um, just in terms of the people coming to us for work within MetLife. Uh, to be involved in their project. So we've done a lot in terms of changing the organization as well as enforcing uh, a, the discipline of quality across uh, MetLife. So um, one thing you'll hear me talk more about later is um, when we re-looked at the organization to instantiate the test engineering team, we also looked at how we were delivering and what worked and what didn't work. So we'll talk about this core and critical model um, as we go forward. Okay. Um, in terms of the, the overall landscape, I, I think many of you have probably seen this in your organizations or as IT as a whole. So much is changing externally and internally in terms of capabilities in the marketplace um, and what it means to us as organizations. Um, I'll say a quote that's kind of old hat at this point. You know, every technology, every company must be a technology company. Um, you know, IT here at MetLife used to have a tagline um, that we fuel business growth. I think that is still true, but now I think we're integrated with business growth. There's no longer there's no longer a company strategy and an IT strategy. There is one strategy, um, and I think as as I talk more about MetLife as we go on, you'll see that you know we're embarking on a new strategy with digital at the centerpiece. So all of our IT teams have really, um, you know, come on board and embraced that. So um, what we're seeing in the marketplace is, is, is historically in IT, users might have been uh, an area within the company, your users of your systems or, um, you know, some tech-savvy customers outside um, the organization. For a while now, I, I, you, we are all technology users. Um, and what we're starting, we're starting to see that come into the. Re it's reshaping how we do business, both at MetLife and many other organizations. Um, the tolerance for poor quality is minimal. And you think about like how often do you go back to a website that's poor performing? How often, how quickly do you uninstall an application on your mobile phone if it drains your battery? And how often do you go back to it after a one-time, one-time failure? So while there's all this change is happening around us, um, quality remains it, it, it remains as important, if not more important uh, than ever, because the tolerance is just minimal. Um, I think to me, you know, as a consumer myself, it's apparent and decisive in industries like retail. Um, but when you go to industries that are more complex, uh, you think of well, retail is complex. I should take that back. But just different industries. Um, think of a manufacturing company where there's a higher cost to entry um, for the tech for them to technology to transform technologically 
um, or at an insurance company where you have it's a highly we're a highly regulated industry and our products are very complex. Uh, life life insurance is um, a product that you buy and then you hold for decades and it pays out decades later. So MetLife has been in business since um, you know the mid 1860s. We have policies that have been in effect um, you know since the you know early mid mid 20th century. So there's a long tail that we have to support uh, for these products on, from a technology uh, perspective. So we have a lot of drivers coming to us from the outside in terms of where technology as a whole is going, but then also internally as we continually look uh, to reshape ourselves uh, for the new paradigm. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Chris Bartosik. So I head up the test engineering organization here at MetLife. I've been here uh, about two and a half years. Uh, prior to that, um, the majority of my career has been in health IT um, and um, product development and application development as well. Uh, so it's great meeting everyone virtually. Uh, so when we really looked at uh, <clears throat> kind of taking our snapshot about 12 to 18 months ago, one of the things we said was, you know, we, we we had to uh, split up our approach, if you will, and when we looked at uh, where we were, uh, where the market was, uh, where we needed to be, we really identified the transition uh, from just a test, as Kim had mentioned earlier, to more of, a, of an assurance organization. We, we really saw it in, in three phases, if you will, and I'm going to cover, uh, go through those just in a moment. Uh, but we, what we did was we actually broke out those into three swim lanes, your typical people, process, and technology. And what you'll see is, as I progress through this slide, you'll see that uh, on the left of the initial phases of just being in a test role, uh, you'll see that there's much more of a, of a general kind of approach, and then you'll see it get much more specific to the right. So first, from a people standpoint, so when you look at um, your kind of your initial phase of a tran transition, and we were certainly here, uh, you know, really the, the kind of the, the standard tester role, if you will, um, much more siloed in nature. And by siloed, it's really just a matter of kind of just focusing on uh, only your space, uh, not necessarily uh, branching out and, and really looking at, you know, what are my business drivers, what are my technology drivers, just your small scope of work in the box that you, st you stayed in. Um, typically, what we saw was uh, the majority uh, were, were not necessarily as technical in nature um, and, and much more, um, you know, focused on having manual processing uh, as kind of the driver uh, rather than other uh, enablers uh, that you will, I'll talk about just in a few moments, uh, particularly with respect to um, automation. On the process side, in kind of your first phase of transition, uh, very much processed, uh, very much waterfall oriented, um, with fairly hard gates. So when we took a we took a look uh, at where we were, you know, the the kind of the hard gate uh, mechanisms where you typically would uh, not start QA until you received uh, requirements that were 100% or design specs that were 100%. Uh, very much linear in nature. Uh, from a from a, a data perspective, most of the data at that point in time was fairly static in nature. Uh, so there wasn't the ability to try to uh, traverse between various systems of record to uh, bubble up, you know, here, uh, here's some information in terms of trend analysis, here's where we're not as efficient, uh, very much a compartmentalized type of view, um, and much more um, at that point in time of a um, kind of a point in time rather than a real-time view. Uh, the majority of the focus, uh, the majority of the, the focus at that point was also um, onshore, uh, and again, still siloed uh, focus from a process standpoint. So that meaning that, uh, you know, QA or test at that point in time was just focused on test, uh, not necessarily trying to influence uh, phases uh, before or phases after. From a technology standpoint, um, at, that, at that point in time, highly proprietary in nature, uh, very tightly coupled, and by tightly coupled, I mean that the, uh, if uh, the test organization was uh, building some type of solution to accommodate whatever uh, whatever requirement or whatever need. Uh, it was very much uh, in a silo again type of mentality where you didn't necessarily uh, need to consider uh, you know how to integrate into uh, the development 
um, ecosystem or how to ensure that your business users in kind of your final phase of UAT would use it as well. Very much of a silo kind of approach. And the majority of the technology at that point in time was on-prem. So as we move to kind of this middle phase, uh, there's, there's a little bit more of a kind of a blurring of the lines, if you will. Uh, but you'll see that kind of in this transitional phase uh, between, you know, kind of your standard test to more of an assurance role, uh, you'll see that the uh, folks are becoming more of an application subject matter expert. Uh, they're becoming more knowledgeable of the inputs and outputs. Um, some automation is uh, becoming to get into play, so people are beginning to discuss a little bit more, hey, how do I automate rather than just manually testing things, uh, and also beginning to understand uh, the system itself uh, in terms of the technology stack. Not necessarily a, a true technologist yet, uh, but beginning to understand uh, not just the application, how it functions, but also the technology underneath it um, and in between the systems themselves. On the process side, uh, you're beginning to now measure, uh, you're beginning to measure information, uh, particularly just defects at that point in time, uh, but you are beginning to add, at least beginning to put some measures in place. You are seeing some transition to now some offshore arrangements. Uh, you're beginning to now institute, um, you know, some form of quality gate reviews, and you're also um, seeing some type of blurred ownership between the test slash QA organization and your delivery side and the business side as well. That ownership is beginning to blur, and that's really uh, more about, you know, who kind of owns quality, and you're starting to see that blur a little bit. <clears throat> and then on the technology side, you're, you're starting to see some integration of the test solutions into the broader ecosystem. <clears throat> you're starting to see some cloud beginning to be introduced, uh, and then you're also seeing some of the less traditional vendors beginning to, um, you know, get some momentum and get some visibility with larger uh, enterprise companies uh, beginning to get some traction there as well. From a people standpoint, you're beginning to see much more of a focus on technology, more of a focus on program management, more of a focus on, uh, you know, business acumen as well. So you're seeing that I'm not just a tester, I, I need to be more versed. Uh, from a process standpoint, you're seeing now, you know, you're really thinking of design and optimization you're thinking much more of a managed services kind of approach and quality owned across the SDLC. And then from a technology standpoint, software as a service, uh, less traditional vendors are, are really kind of in the mainstream and um, security is also coming into play as well. Okay. So let's talk about the testing approach before. And again, this was about 12 to 18 months ago. Uh, we really saw the testing is, is really kind of two phases, if you will. Uh, and you'll see that in, in the top there, inputs and capabilities. When we looked at requirements, uh, very manual in nature, very linear uh, in terms of the steps. So uh, we would typically take requirements verbatim. We would build a strategy based off that. The strategy at that point in time was, was fairly, um, fairly linear and self-contained. The same would be said for the design aspect of things as well. So when we would do design, it was really designed about just the piece of work that we needed to test. It wasn't necessarily uh, taking into account the broader ecosystem of change. It was really, you know, I have 12 requirements coming in. I'm just going to test those 12 requirements, and I'm not going to think about the broader impacts of what this could mean. Uh, again, most of our focus was, was manual in nature at that time. And again, we're about, you know, we're probably about 18 months uh, before where we're talking today. Uh, the majority of our testing was manual. We really had two ways to look at it. Um, highly focused on regression and just functional. Uh, automation at that point was really an afterthought. And by that we mean automation was not necessarily part of our standard uh, intake, estimation, uh, planning, all of the types of things that you would expect. Um, it was typically done uh, as a subsequent task. A lot of times what we saw was the automation, uh, by the time the solution was complete, uh, it was uh, already past due to be able to get run and be able to get exploited, if you will. So 
uh, we did have situations where uh, by the time we got something complete, uh, the next type of uh, you know project that would come along maybe six months out, we weren't really able to uh, use the solution uh, to its fullest extent. At that point in time, we only had uh, really, really three types of automation at that point in time. Uh, I've, they're actually categorized in terms of the majority, uh, in, in terms of GUI and then cross-browser services. Uh, the majority of our focus at that point in time was, was uh, GUI, and I've got a stat I'll pull up just in a moment. At that point, we did have some cross-browser uh, testing going on and uh, automation, uh, and very, very limited amount of automation in the services layer, uh, and this was our primary focus. Uh, we didn't, you know, we're a big mainframe organization. We have other systems and subsystems as well that we did not have uh, or not take into consideration at that point in time from an automation perspective. Uh, so you see that mainframe IVR, uh, mobile at that point in time, and data uh, automation really uh, wasn't in our, uh, in our standard offering at that point in time. Uh, back to uh, coverage by execution. Uh, you'll see that at that point we had about 80% of our coverage was manual in nature, uh, and um, of that 20% that we called out automated, uh, almost the, the entire percent, uh, about 95 or so, was, was uh, just focused on the GUI. Uh, and so in doing that, um, the, GUI, the GUI typically changes frequently. If you have automation that's based solely on the front end and you're doing a lot of changes, which we do a lot at MetLife, we have a number of products. Uh, we change them frequently to either keep up with market demand or, or uh, you know, uh, new product offerings. When you have automation that's built solely on that, uh, it's, it's very fragile. Uh, after your first release, uh, you, have, you, know, you have a lot of the code that breaks. Uh, the maintainability and the cost to maintain uh, surpass the opportunities that you really need to think through. Uh, and so that's really kind of the state of where we were at that point in time. Uh, and from a reporting standpoint, they were really spread across multiple dashboards and repositories at that point. Uh, and so we, from, a, uh, you know, from a synthesized view perspective or from a dashboard standpoint, it was very difficult for us at that point to really understand what is the state of the state with respect to tests? Uh, you know, what are my financials? You know, how am I executing? What's my quality? It was very difficult for us to get to that point in a, in a common look and feel. <clears throat> okay. All right, thank you, Chris. I think as you guys may be hearing, Chris is one of the thought leaders here that's really driven us uh, forward over the last couple of years because what we've seen in, in his space is just a vast um, ability to enable the type of t testing that we deliver today. And that's the focus of this slide is, is the delivery part of the organization and the quality management that we've um, instantiated. Um, so along the, the journey with our our, our people aspect, we, did, we established a QMO, a quality management organization. They work with our steering and governance teams uh, to create, again, one solid process and artifacts that people can access. Uh, we have a process council where process is continually revisited uh, for improvements and everyone has a stake um, and voice in that, and that includes our vendor teams as well on and offshore. Um, so the, QM, the QMO um, also plays a bridge between uh, Chris's engineering team and our delivery organization. Um, you know, to me, there there must be a, a healthy push and pull tension uh, between these two groups because, as you hear Chris speaking, we're not just looking at technology for technology's sake. It needs to be operationalized and it needs to have impact. So if we've got a lot of mainframe systems and and we've ignored them, we're addressing that. Um, so that's, that's really the, the, again, the constant tension we want to look at is make sure we're making use of uh, the, the tools that our engineering team has made available to us and make sure that we're getting the right information to the engineering team so they know where, where the impact areas are. Um, so I think we've, we've established a solid connection there and that's something just we'll continue to grow um, as we move forward. Another aspect um, is program management. Um, again, MetLife, big company. We run, um, again, I think it was 1,200 projects, a lot of projects, a lot of work. Um, but our biggest program, the programs are getting more and more complex um, over the past couple of years at MetLife. As you'd expect in an organization like this, there's not just one AD team. There's 
at least five or six we interact with, and they're pretty big teams. Um, so when you have these big programs that are coming together to put new technology on top of legacy systems and integrate them, where in the past those programs have struggled, um, we've taken a step forward with our QMO and our program management skill sets to be a conductor of the end-to-end -end test events. Um, whereas in the past, I think rightfully so, since we were QA was part of different AD teams or part of different organizations, somebody with that end-to-end -end viewpoint wasn't, wasn't oh, we might have had the viewpoint, but it wasn't evident we had an accountability uh, for it. And what we've done is I think we've taken a good one, two, three steps forward to say we've got the visibility and we've got this. So you look at something like MetLife's split off of Bright House Financials earlier in the year, we own that end-to-end -end test event that included over 100,000 test cases as we stood up basically a new IT organization um, for a company that we spun off. Um, that's something that would have been very different a few years ago and without the capabilities, um, both people, process, and tools uh, that we have in place today. So it's something um, I'm very proud of uh, for what the team has done. So next, um, governance and steering. So again, we had these roles in a you know a couple of years ago existed within the organization, but they were part-time roles. They were done off the side of the desk. Um, so having dedicated folks, where um, you know financial accounting process is a key component um, of their role. Again, they may have more than one role, but it's not project delivery, it, which always will take precedence over. Um, something like a process improvement because of just the nature of the beast. Um, now we have folks that this, these types of roles are their job. Uh, we, we always, again, had vendor management, vendor relationship discussions, um, you know, contractual reviews and so forth. But now, again, there's a discipline attached to it, folks who understand that that's one of their accountabilities um, for my team, as well as a really active partnership um, with our vendors to say governance is not a one-way street. Um, it's really where it, the model before was informal, I'd say, at best. Now we have a formal governance structure with set meetings and content, and really it's all about facilitating a two-way conversation where um, we see ourselves as the enablers of vendor performance, not, not just not only a customer that can come to them with particular complaints or areas of improvements and some thank yous, it's a two-way street of what we can do for them and vice versa. Um, now I hit, up, I hit upon the process innovation and improvement rigor, again, something I'm very proud of in terms of what we've done for solidifying a solid process across the team and pushing that um, to our, our partners in AD to make sure they're working well with us. Um, the last component here that I alluded to in, in the first slide I discussed was a, a kind of a two-tower model uh, for test delivery for core and critical programs. And this one deserves, you know, a couple of, a couple of minutes to talk about. Um, what we found, again, I mentioned that 1,200 projects now a few times. By and large, many of those go off without a hitch from the AD side as well as the, the testing or quality side. And what we really we created a bimodal model of sorts where we said let's focus where we need it. Um, the core programs are what we'll say our BAU, our bread and butter, but that's about 70, 75 um, percent of our of our work. But there were other programs that sometimes we call them complex. Um, it's a little bit of a misnomer because the core projects are complex too. So critical became the word we started to use, and th that could be because it's complex in terms of multiple AD teams, a ton of integrations, new technologies, um, or even if it didn't fit any of those uh, categories, perhaps just it's one of management's top programs um, this year for enacting a MetLife strategy. So we really under tried to focus our resources um, where they are best utilized. So we created this core model where our, our vendor team, who's highly capable, was in is increasingly leveraged um, to deliver um, with as few FTE resources as possible. Um, and our critical programs have increased FTE focus um, as, well or, as well as getting increased focus um, from our vendor in key roles as well. Uh, the command center is up, picture is up on your right. 
think for the folks on the, the, the phone, this is nothing new to you, but what we've really been doing every opportunity we get is to call out the critical roles um, for a successful test project. Model isn't meant to be one size fits all, uh, but it is meant to show that we should have a name in the box for every one of these roles. That doesn't mean that the name can't be shared across boxes or in more than one project, but we do need to be realistic about people's workload and capabilities. And this has been a wonderful way to articulate uh, to our AD and business teams um, you know, who the folks on our staffs are, why we need certain roles, why we need certain people, um, because, you know, when you're in the heat of test execution, um, for example, that triage manager becomes a real critical component to, to every daily conversation. So, I think uh, that hits the, the highlights here. I'll pass over to Chris, okay. go through test engineering. So, we'll cover test engineering just for, for a moment. Uh, if you remember a slide a few slides ago, we, we talked about kind of the three phases of transition, if you will, kind of going from a test mm -hmm. over to an assurance, more of an assurance organization. And so uh, what Kim was just talking about in terms of some, some organizational aspects, some disciplines that we're putting in place, more structured kind of a way of doing things from a governance and steering, um, you know, that was all of trying to move us from recognizing this is where we are at test, and if we want to get to that full-fledged assurance aspect of quality, um, you know, we, we need to take some of these steps, covering the quality management just a few moments ago, and now we'll talk about test engineering. Um, and, and test engineering is it's, uh, really, really four, uh, four facets of, of what we did. The first was is that we had to understand that uh, the market is ever-changing and that uh, if we have to keep a pulse on what is going on the market. And uh, we spent, gosh, probably six to 12 months working with a lot of folks in the industry to try to say, you know, this is where we are, here's where we need to go, here's what the business is driving us to do, um, whether it's from a regulatory standpoint or just, you know, internal uh, driven from, from MetLife. So, you know, we, we tried to expand our view to create that future state. We also focused on uh, or began to say, you know, open source is, is acceptable. Uh, in terms of, you know, let's look at those types of alternatives as well, same with software as a service, and the whole cloud virtualization aspect as well. Uh, so really looking at technology not necessarily as either your, uh, your first um, suggestion in terms of fixing an issue, uh, we really changed that dynamic to say, make technology an enabler of, uh, you know, your, your whole solution rather than technology uh, relying on technology to make your decision for you. And then, you know, we had a, a significant inventory of assets. <clears throat> we had um, uh, kind of a, a couple of different views of, of, of our assets. And, and assets are, are somewhat, somewhat general in nature, but what we're referring to here is, is more specifically around auto, automation assets. Uh, and we really said three things. Um, what do we have? That's number one, and I know that may sound a little bit, you know, um, kind of elementary, if you will, but with a company our size, it's been around this long, who had tens of thousands upon thousands of cases, if you will, uh, we had to get that analysis done, and that was significant in, in, in task. Uh, but then we also said, you know what, if we've got it, let's go ahead and run it. Um, at that point in time, we were uh, somewhat hesitant on running the automated solutions, one, because we may, may not necessarily have had a good way of documenting it in the past. But we changed that, and we said, you know what, we need to go ahead and do it, and we need to find, we need to see the fallout of it. And by the way, we also need to create a very solid maintenance strategy as well. Uh, a lot of times, you'll you'll uh, you'll be in situations where you have to quickly do something, and if you don't have a way to go back and keep it fresh, you're going to be in a situation where you run it once and then you forget. And that is not what we're doing now. Uh, we also made a very deliberate move, particularly in starting off 2017 where our focus now is in the middleware. The middleware layers, it is not on the presentation layer. I mentioned that before about how the UI is highly, highly fragile, um, but really we're, we're, our deliberate approach is into that middleware layer and everything we do. Uh, we also are uh, integrating into the DevOps um, stack here at MetLife, and we're also uh, focused on refactoring legacy uh, where feasible. 
from an organizational standpoint, we really did three things. We created capability centers. Uh, we focused, uh, we had specific focus on digital automation and DevOps, uh, specific teams just to do those, uh, those types of initiatives. We are building out a shared services uh, capability uh, as we speak, focused on TDM tools and environments and many other things. Uh, and then we're also, we fully integrate into the delivery pipeline. So just kind of a brief overview of how we introduced test engineering and some of those core facets of what we needed to do in order to affect the change. So now let's spend a few minutes on, you know, where we are today. Uh, and, and today is, uh, you know, we've got a, a number of different views here that we'll, we'll kind of traverse through on this slide. Uh, I think the most important thing is hopefully you'll get out of this slide in particular that, uh, you know, it's, 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 um, it's certainly doable, um, but it takes a very deliberate approach and that it's okay to not be 100% there yet in a particular uh, strategy or uh, technology. Uh, you got to start the process. And so we, we basically broke it up in three different um, views, if you will, inputs and outputs, capability and management. So in today's world, uh, the inputs and outputs, it, it's, it's very dynamic in nature. So the way that work comes into QA uh, comes in from, from multiple angles, very iterative, uh, requirements, use cases, uh, all of those, all those types of inputs that were once uh, very linear, very, um, uh, you know, word-based, if you will, or Excel-based, they're they're very fluid now. And so we have to have the ability to accept those and digest those. Uh, and so whether that's from a technology standpoint that brings those in, or that's from a people methodology standpoint, you have to be able to accept those dynamic inputs. The strategies as well is is much more. Uh, dynamic than it was uh, in the past. So strategies are evolving. So uh, we typically will uh, draft a strategy uh, at the very beginning of uh, whatever that work product is <clears throat> to ensure that our architects are focused on it, that our leads are focused on it, and that, you know, we don't wait for, you know, the, the kind of your waterfall approach for something to be completely done before we start our work. It's much more fluid in nature. Uh, design and optimization is a significant focus for us today. Uh, both of those we've we've got visually depicted there that they're kind of interchanging. They are very fluid. They go back and forth bidirectional. Uh, a lot of what we do today uh, and really going into 18 is going to be focused on how do we really ensure that coverage is accurate? How do we ensure that, uh, you know, when we say, you know, done is done, that we're able to uh, articulate that in a way that uh, is not just based off of my, uh, you know, my defect count or my test case count. It's really much more broad in nature. Uh, and then automation, we've got, uh, we have built and designed a, a significant amount around automation in the past 12 months. We've rolled out a number of frameworks. Uh, we are bringing in technologies as well to complement those capabilities. We have focused on having test data inventories to help drive and push that automation rather than uh, the point in time of, of where we were before. We are certainly not there 100%, but we have the discipline now and the people who are trying to drive that to make it uh, fed over and over and over again, uh, and that is really the intent. Uh, obviously, everything is is really our focus on on digital from where we are. From a capability standpoint, we've we've broken down in three different ways. Uh, the first is what we call as as hardened. Um, these capabilities, uh, although uh, may fairly be uh, newly launched, we do consider those hardened. Um, that does not mean that we don't have opportunity to bring in other uh, technologies or processes, but we do feel good about what we're doing. Uh, you'll see mobile, um, the open source we've rolled out. Uh, we do have some middleware now that is coming to take uh, take hold. Uh, accessibility is a big focus of ours, so uh, everything from, you know, the, the regulatory aspect of accessibility to really try to consider what is global uh, and, and how do we ensure that the solutions we have uh, from a shared services capability can be exploited and used across the globe. Uh, and then cross-browser as well. So really kind of that one-for-many approach from a presentment standpoint uh, is certainly um, here and now what we do. From a test data management standpoint, data automation and scriptless automation, uh, we really consider those as somewhat emerging in nature. So we haven't quite cracked that nut yet in everything that we need to do. Uh, we've spent the last six to nine months, particularly the test data management side of it, really focused in two different flavors. We have uh, the delivery organization, which is really focused on the methodologies of managing data as it 
pertains to a particular project or program. And then we also have work going on in the engineering team, which is really more focused on kind of those underlying technology components. And by the time we're done with both, they should meet. And then uh, you'll have a uh, basically a full 360 view of how we do test data management here with respect to QA. Uh, data automation is another uh, area that we've spent quite a bit of time, particularly in, in, in 2017, focused on. Uh, we do have a number of solutions, but uh, we will be growing that because data is uh, significant here at MetLife. Uh, most of the programs we have now uh, are not just focused on one particular application or one set of subsystems. They're much more enterprise focused and now much more uh, global focused as well. So we need to take that into account. Uh, and then Scriptless we see as a huge opportunity for us. We have <clears throat> uh, many other teams uh, at MetLife that we feel as though Scriptless would be a, a good opportunity for us to help exploit that capability where you don't have to rely on um, just engineers to do your work. You should be able to have some form of a drag and drop capability as well uh, to automate. The last area is really around R&D. Uh, so we have three areas, mainframe, IVR, and virtualization. If you remember the first slide, I had those um, X'd out. Uh, they're, just emer they're just starting now, so we consider those as R&D. So we, we haven't uh, taken all of that in yet, but we are moving forward. Uh, and so we'll see a lot of momentum, particularly in the next 12 months in those three areas. We are spending some time on cognitive as well. So defect management, but much more in the analytics space. Uh, and then from a test management repository standpoint, we have much more data, uh, but we also have a much more easy, we have a much more consistent way to present that data as well uh, to try to get that common state of the state, if you will, with respect to, uh, to QA. Okay, so here are some, some areas of transformation in flight. Uh, so we, we are focused on uh, really from a lab standpoint, from a hybrid lab utilization, including desktop, uh, and really our approach is a single platform for all of digital QA. Um, we have cross-browser, mobile, accessibility, performance, you name it. That is really what we're focused on right now. We have uh, numerous uh, POCs and pilots in play, where it's, uh, whether it's building out a, um, an internal cloud, working on an external cloud or something in between, we're spending a significant amount of time in that. Uh, we, we have a, a number here, you know, from an from a automation standpoint, we've increased 300% in execution just in one quarter. We have done a significant amount in terms of bringing some in-house solutions and also uh, market-leading solutions to bring those in. Uh, we're addressing client server and mainframe, as I mentioned before. Uh, we now have automation first, really, is, is kind of our DNA, uh, and you can probably, uh, ex you know, understand that a, a, you know, a group this size with 650 plus resources, um, you know, having that as, as kind of part of your DNA is one thing, but really operationalizing it is another. So a lot of what we've done in 2017 is focused on the uh, enablement components of uh, QA, uh, and so 2018, a, a lot of the focus now will be on operationalizing it. Uh, and that's really, um, you know, certainly automation is, is a big piece of that. Shift left, obviously, many of you on the, on the you know, webinar have probably heard this over and over. Uh, it's certainly something that we have taken uh, and, and really run with, but um, the, the nice thing about the shift left is that uh, the position that QA is in today as it was, you know, 12 to 18 months ago, it's much more of a cohesive approach rather than QA uh, kind of being out there and, and um, in its own little space, it's much more of a cohesive approach in terms of shift left. So our partners in the delivery side, our partners in the business side, everyone is kind of talking that same, uh, that same speed. Uh, early de defect identification, improved customer service is all what we do. Again, blurring the lines between hard handoffs, we spoke about that earlier. Uh, tighter requirements integration testing, certainly something that, uh, you know, as you, if you remember the, the diagram a few moments ago, much more uh, fluid in nature, uh, and then continuous testing. Um, everything really our focus, we're pouring into continuous testing and integration uh, back into the project life cycle to reduce cycle time uh, and increase quality. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, so in terms of the con innovation and continuous improvement, I think it was evident in a number of Chris's slides is that this is not a one-time deal that we do it and move on. This is an ongoing 
um, journey and that won't stop with the things that you see on the slide that are even in the R&D mode. There'll always be something next and we'll always need to reevaluate what was done uh, prior. So MetLife has a very strong enterprise architecture team um, and the, the, the new QA organization, particularly with test engineering, um, allows us to have a logical partner with the enterprise architecture team uh, with, with Chris's group um, and our test architect roles. Um, we've really, um, th this three-year roadmap that Chris alluded to that we published, that was new, publishing a test architecture roadmap um, that is something that's beyond our team and published wider with our enterprise architecture group. I think it's raised our visibility uh, to the architecture team and vice versa in terms of them uh, being aware of where the quality team is is in the space and what they can do to support us. Um, you know, and in terms of innovation for project funding, I think, you know, again, many QA teams are in the same boat as us, is that we are we are very project driven. Um, and in some cases that can be at the to the detriment of innovation and continuous improvement. Um, what we've done as an organization has allowed us to be in a much better position uh, to position ourselves for investment mm -hmm. because it's part of broader IT capabilities and people are seeing the results um, in the projects and programs and production stability. Um, so we're doing that to make sure that we're, again, continuously building our, our tool sets um, as well as, um, you know, evalu ongoing evaluation of our process. Um, you know, the third area here, upskilling of uh, staffing, we continue to look at our look at our talent and bring in highly technical skills where they're needed, both from an employee perspective um, or from our from our vendor perspective. Um, so I think, you know, areas that we continue to focus on um, are data, you know, test data, big data, and the continued focus as we implement kind of agile models at MetLife um, and look to expand uh, global capabilities. You know, MetLife is in over three dozen countries. Um, so just continue to understand the role that we can play um, in testing around the globe. Um, and again, alignment to MetLife strategy. I made the point earlier, um, quality is, is as important, if not more important than ever. Um, and in terms of a strategy, there's not an IT strategy, there's a company strategy, um, and quality has to be embedded uh, throughout everything we do. So, so from here, I wanna turn it over to Amir. Perfecto's been an excellent partner to us. So uh, thank you guys for hosting today. Thank you so much, guys. Um, very excited to be with you on this webinar. Thank you so much to MetLife for sharing their perspective and their journey and the good and bad and so forth. I'm sure we'll, in a couple of minutes we'll talk about some of the questions that we've seen. Um, what I wanted to spend a couple of minutes on is discussing what is the blueprint of organizations as they select um, you know, as MetLife said, you know, the tool, the journey and, and the process um, and coaching the people to getting into the, this rhythm of, you know, maintaining quality while accelerating an innovation. And so some of these things include maximizing digital test coverage. And what that means is that you don't have to be blocked at any point in time because your lab doesn't support a device or a browser or an operating system or maybe a, a function that you're trying to achieve, either it's fingerprint or, you know, maybe check scanning or any, any of those functions. And I think here with MetLife, we've seen really a good leverage of the lab with, you know, uh, the usage of eight concurrent different web browsers that can be configured on the fly, you know, 12 iOS and 12 Android devices. Um, a lot of emphasis on utilizing beta uh, OS both on devices as well as uh, browsers accessing new hardware such as iPhone 8 and then using the advanced functions like wind tunnel and so forth. And really I think when you look at this, what's your metric or litmus test in order to define success? I think it's, you know, the quality is sort of uh, thought about in the same token of innovation. It's the same context. And if you will, you see, you know, testers, quality people moving from doing the recurring regression test on a day-to-day -day basis on multiple different platforms 
into saying, okay, there are recurring processes that we can automate and we can let machines do that and just focus on what failed versus the quality team now is joining the sprint, hearing what's new in the sprint, what features are going to be created, and really creating test code inside of that sprint so that new set of features are going to be tested every night as developers develop uh, the code. And with that, you know, the next piece is high degree of automation. So as I just said, you know, you want to achieve a situation where what, whatever is recurring and possible, maybe 80, 90 percent of your test cases will be automated to eliminate this recurring investment in people and, and so forth and time uh, into transitioning into the new technology. And I think some of the enablers that we've seen in MetLife, you know, I've seen a lot of questions around, you know, up upgrading the skill sets of QA people and what's the process to be used. You know, I think that uh, MetLife did a really nice job in adopting a, the quantum framework, which is open source, um, that all, both supports both the uh, well-enabled individuals that are writing in Java and are supporting the team, but also transitioning the manual testers into writing stable and scalable test code using BDD and Cucumber. At the same time, utilizing open source standard technologies in terms of Appium and Selenium, and now really considering what's next, you know, in terms of enabling developers to write Espresso and Exit tests, really increasing the, the parallel executions, and now even moving further down the DevOps cycle in terms of the Jenkins plugins and other plugins that I'm going to talk you in a second. What really this creates, you, you see larger test suites executing in a parallel fashion in a more frequent manner and increasing the percent of automation. This is really, in my view, a really big success factor uh, in the work that's been done at MetLife. The next piece is how does the tool integrate into your tool chain? Clearly, it's inconceivable to come and introduce an organization to a completely new framework. If you have the, the lab and the tools, you know, whether it's Jenkins or anything else, that are easily embedded into the process and into the existing tools, and the, the transition into Cucumber is really uh, hopefully easy because it's, it's English based and so forth. These are little advantages that, you know, eventually translate into high efficiency of testing and, and QA folks. And then you can start thinking about JIRA, Slack integrations, and things of that nature for very real time alerting of the team of issues and so forth. And the last thing, what we've seen in MetLife and, and many other accounts, with scalable set of executions come the scalable set of data. And I, I'm meeting many, many people who are spending hours and hours and days plowing through data, trying to understand really what are the trends, what's the needle in the haystack, that if I find it, I'll be able to really resolve many, many failures at the same time. And I think what we've seen in MetLife is really the utilization of the hierarchical big data reporting suite that both allows you to group, um, you know, test failures by custom tags, by operating system, by screen size, and so forth. And from there, very quickly, you know, dive into the rich single execution report, but also elevate visibility into the quality, the health of the application in real time during the sprint using the CI dashboard, but also give the heat map and the quality of the app visibility into the executives so that they can decide whether, you know, which feature or which team to invest more time to reduce risk with the common release, uh, release date. And so what we're seeing, again, here in MetLife and many other organizations, is A, the executive visibility is now enhanced and more people are aware of the hard efforts being done and the good quality improvement that's being achieved with this team, but also accelerated different detection and correction. Because if you can now run a test, you know, com composed of maybe 10 parallel executions of five tests and get a response within, let's say, five minutes, the developer immediately knows what he broke and he can go back and fix it 
sometimes these issues don't even end up in JIRA because the developer knows exactly what to fix and he fixes it immediately. This is a much more efficient process compared to finding about a bug, you know, three and six weeks later where you need to undo code and undo the work that you've done. So I recommend to everybody who's, who's watching this webinar, take a look to the left. What are the, you know, what are the, your asks for a solution and a process and a team that needs to go through these changes and how MetLife did it successfully with, um, you know, with their initiative. Okay, and with that, I'll turn it over to Austin. Maybe we can achieve a question with you. Yes, so we've got lots of questions. Um, let's start with this. What skills do you look for in the QA engineer? Kim, Chris, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, we could, we could probably both go back and forth. I think one of the, one of the most important things is that, um, uh, you, you know, you, you have to have what we've seen that's, that's been of value, uh, particularly in this vertical industry, is, is, the, is the ability to approach work a little bit more um, uh, abstract, if you will. So uh, not being as linear in terms of the way that you, uh, you process or actually do your work, it's, it's trying to be a little bit more abstract. So some of that is, uh, you know, coming up through the ranks, particularly in, in, the, in an analyst type role, uh, is, is always beneficial. Uh, but then also having to, uh, you know, having uh, a, a good way to um, understand technology as well, right? So it's, you know, we don't look for someone who's an expert in DB2 or someone who's an expert in Java. That's not what we, that's not what we look for. But we try to have that balance where uh, you, you know to ask different questions and, again, to the earlier topic of um, not just taking verbatim, but asking those questions a little bit differently uh, to make sure you're you're addressing the the functions of the work, but you're also looking at technology as well and try to understand the inputs and outputs and the change that this may cause. And a follow-up question to that would be: How how do you do that transition from manual testers to automation testers? Yeah, so uh, great is a great question, and we, we, we had a couple of different uh, parallel paths going. One is we you know we had to keep the, the wheels going on the on the bus uh, while we took on this transformation, and so um, we uh, at a point we had a little bit of a bubble approach, and we knew that going in that um, what we saw would be effective is <clears throat> some form of a of a shadowing approach as well, where the manual testers were continuing to do the work, uh, but then you had uh, automation engineers, software engineering test, if you will, that would um, sit to shadow to understand some of the uh, some of the application along the way. So you weren't basically going into the work if I was now an automation engineer uh, cold, if that makes sense. So somewhat of a of a warm transfer uh, we saw was was um, something of, of value. We also um, worked with. Uh, our partner in, in terms of uh, creating not just that capability in the engineering team, but also uh, on the delivery side as well. So you had a representative who is, we now have representatives who are versed, well versed in uh, the technology stack and the engineering team, uh, but they're also a, a subject matter expert in the line of business for delivery. So you kind of have that one-to-one -one, uh, where before uh, we had a lot of the work just in engineering and it was kind of that that hard uh, kind of that, that that hard break between engineering and delivery, we've we've solved that uh, with with trying to blend and, and synthesize the the communication a little bit more than what we had before. Yeah, I mean, Chris said it well. Again, our vendor team was um, you know grabbed this with both hands in terms of training a large number of, of people on the team and new folks on the team, so making sure they had the right um, the right skills for us. Um, I'll also, say in terms of process. Um, that bridge that Chris mentioned um, is facilitated also by, by very pointed intake conversations. So we make sure that folks who may not have the visibility for one reason or another across the projects or our capabilities, when a new work is taken in, um, we have, a, we have um, insight into where automation is not being used and we explore why and then understand if there's a capability that can be applied or if that needs to go on the list as a potential for the future. So we have implemented processes to help, you know, enable the people um, where they need to be. Thank yeah, you guys think, for uh, answering. 
Yeah, I think yeah. To, to, to build off that too is, you know, we took a very, um, I, I think, you know, some, some, some can look at it as a, as a little bit tactical, but we knew going in we had to be very tactical. We had to be very deliberate. So to Kim's point, you know, we, we crafted training, specific training programs. We do uh, monthly lunch and learns with all the staff. We, we uh, bring in a lot of different um, vendors from the market to do presentations. We try to, you know, inject uh, some, some of what's going on in the industry as well through our entire staff. Uh, and now that staff, uh, which, is, which is encouraging, has grown from just QA, but it's now much more broad when we do these types of um, uh, presentations or lunch and learns, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, more, uh, there, there are more teams that, that join um, outside of QA as well. So we certainly have done some, it's been difficult, but we've, we've made some progress in terms of generating interest and momentum. Great. Um, so we do have more questions, but we've run out of time. So to everyone still um, logged in, we will follow up with you individually. Um, and thanks again for, thanks to our panelists for um, taking the time today to present. Um, any, any last words? <laughs> no, I just want to thank everyone for attending today. It's, it's been good. Yep. And thank you to the Perfecto team for hosting, hosting this. We appreciate it. Been a good one. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. All right.